Good morning. Good morning. And welcome this morning. Uh, glad to see you all. Remember to set your clocks. Uh, I will be anxiously watching the doors now to see in about 40 minutes uh, who comes wandering in. Typically there is usually one or two that come, come in, so it's always entertaining. I can sometimes give them a little smile and I really can get away with it, I'll give them a wave, but uh, we welcome you here as we worship together, as we celebrate the good news of Christ, and as we continue our journey on this, uh, this Lenten season, as we make our way to the cross, as we make our way to the empty tomb. Uh, please note there are a few announcements, uh, because we can now actually make announcements. Uh, our circuit breaker has ended, so we are allowed to go back. Uh, we are allowed to have meetings and uh, group activities. Uh, men's group and women's group will be meeting uh, this week. Men's group, 1030 at Canoe Cove Church on Thursday. Uh, women's group, Tuesday morning here at Clyde River Church at uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, Bible study. We'll begin once again for the charge this evening, 7 o'clock here at Clyde River Church. And then Thursday at 1 o'clock at Canoe Cove Church, we'll be looking at communion. Uh, communion in uh, the Christian church. What does it mean? Where are the differences? Where are the similarities? Uh, so that's this evening, 7 o'clock here at Clyde River. And then 1 o'clock at Canoe Cove on Thursday. Uh, youth group, we are looking at doing youth group on Friday, March 26th. Uh, we are hoping to go to Kerry Pool. There'll be more information next week. We may need to do a sign-up sheet so we have an idea on who will be going or who is interested in going. Uh, so that will be, uh, be made known and available either through Facebook or uh, other various means. Uh, so please note that. Um, elders are asked to note there will be a session meeting on Monday, March 22nd, uh, 7 p.m. at Clyde River Church. So elders are asked to please note that. Um, also, a big uh, congratulations to Austin Potts uh, from the North River 4-H, and uh, he and his family are at Canoe Cove Congregation. Uh, he, his uh, animal was named the Reserve Grand Champion this week, uh, this week at the Easter Beef uh, Show and Sale here. So big congratulations to Austin and uh, Nolan and Addison. Uh, Austin's younger brother and sister also did very well in the, in the show and sale as well. So we want to congratulate them. Uh, as we prepare our hearts and minds today, we do welcome those who are watching on YouTube or on Facebook as we welcome you here to Central Parish. And as one of the things, one of the ministries we have here is our prayer shawl ministry. And it's a, it's a vital one and a, an important one for us. It's a reminder to us of God's connectedness with uh, and among his people and a reminder that we are called to pray for and with one another. This morning we are praying and dedicating a prayer shawl uh, for Perry. Now Perry will be heading over for surgery at the IWK on the 22nd. So we do want to remember him and his family at this time. And so we're going to have a time of prayer uh, for Perry and uh, for the family. So let's turn to God. Let's pray together. Loving and gracious God, we thank you that you are the one who watches over you are the one who comforts, the one who strengthens, the one who gives to us courage. And we pray, O oh God, now that as we ask your blessing upon this prayer shawl, we will be mindful of your presence with Perry this day, that you will be preparing him uh, for the journey he will be making for the surgery that is in front of him. Grant to him your peace and your comfort. Watch over his family at this difficult time. We thank you that you are the God who strengthens us and watches over us and loves us with an unending love. We thank you for the joy that Perry brings. We thank you for his laughter. We thank you for his smile. And we pray, O oh God, for your continued hand of healing to be upon him, that you will indeed guide the doctors and nurses, that you will grant to them your wisdom and yours alone. We thank you that this prayer shawl might be a reminder to Perry of the thoughts and prayers of us, his church family, on this journey, that he will be ever mindful of your presence with him, wrapping your arms around him, protecting him, and loving him. Watch over him this day, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to join together with our call to worship.
Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God save us forever. God gathers God's people from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Let us thank the Lord for such all praise and love. Let us praise God. Let us praise God for God's wonderful works to humankind. We will worship God with thanksgiving and tell of God's deeds with the songs of joy. Let's turn to God now. Let us pray together. Wondrous and eternal God, we thank you. For great and wonderful are your works. Your steadfast love is from everlasting to everlasting. You have come among us in Jesus Christ to save us. Where there is darkness, you bring light. Where there is sadness, you bring words of hope. Where there is despair, you bring new potential and new possibilities. You bring healing for the sick and forgiveness for the sinner. You bring justice for the oppressed. We ask, O oh God, that you will move mightily in our midst, that as we gather this morning to worship, we do so with a sense of joy, a sense of awe, a sense of wonder. And we ask, O oh God, that you will meet us here in this place, that you will stir our hearts and minds, that you will create within us a deep and abiding passion to do the things of your kingdom, to show the world the abundant love found in Jesus Christ. Sustain us as we worship, as we praise, and as we celebrate. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to join our hearts together now as we sing to God's glory. We're going to sing the hymn, He's Got the Whole World in His Hand. seeking his guidance, his wisdom, and his understanding. Let us pray. God of light and truth, send to us your Holy Spirit to move in us and among us this day. Speak to us through the scriptures. Speak to us through the power of your word, so that we indeed might go into the world and share the good news that is found in Jesus Christ, who is the living word. May indeed we be transformed. May our hearts be moved. And may we be motivated to share, to show, and to live the Word of God in our lives, in our communities, wherever we might go. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our response of reading uh, this morning it's taken from Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord save his souls. Be redeemed from the hand of the Lord. Though 
those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in those wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. There, they were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Our next reading is first taken from the book of Numbers, chapter 21. Reading verses 4 through 9. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. Our last reading is taken from John's Gospel. John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Amen, and may the word of God speak to us this day. May we find strength in his word. May we find comfort in his presence among us. We'll now turn to God once again. We're going to lift our voices in praise to him as we sing the hymn, In His Time. Now, I have a confession. I do not like snakes. Not a fan. Uh, they rank right up there with hornets and wasps for me. Uh, they're just, they're just creepy. There's no other way around it. Uh, I was not a fan of the movie uh, Snakes on a Plane. Uh, it wouldn't be one that I'd be rushing out to the cinemas to see. And then we have this portion of scripture that we have in the book of Numbers. And again, it wouldn't be a portion of scripture that I would be rushing to look at, to talk about, to discuss, because it deals with snakes. But it deals with much more than snakes. It deals with God's people and God's relationship with his people and how sometimes we can get so caught up, so fixated, on other things that we miss out on what God is doing. We lose sight of what is actually important. We lose sight over what will last. 
In this portion of scripture, we see the people of Israel are, are wandering. Scripture tells us that uh, they were going and taking the route uh, along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. In other words, they had to take a detour. They had to take the long way around because the king of Edom wouldn't let Moses and the people of Israel cut through his land. So to rub salt in the wound, here they were wandering around the desert where it can reach temperatures of 120 degrees, where there is little water, very little food, and now they're told, instead of taking the most direct route, they had to take a longer meandering. Scripture tells us that the people of Israel wandered for 40 years. They wandered for 40 years because they wouldn't listen. They wandered because they wouldn't listen to God. It's like when Lisa and I go driving. I wander because I don't listen to Lisa, who has a better sense of direction than I do. And when I don't listen to Lisa, we usually end up going off the beaten track. And there's been more than one or two or five or ten trips that go horribly awry because I think I know the way. And we're all like that. We all think we know the way. We all think we know the direction we're supposed to be heading in. And the Israelites thought they had. They thought they had it figured out. But then they didn't listen to God. God said, look, you can go to the promised land. You can have what I have promised you. But instead of claiming the promise of God, they said no. They let fear lead them instead of faith. They allowed fear to overcome their faith. And because of that, they were left wandering in the desert for 40 years. The hard part about the book of Numbers is that we see over and over and over again the people of Israel making the same mistake, turning against God, complaining about God, being punished, and then coming back to God again. In our, word, in our scripture this morning, we see a very similar refrain or a very familiar refrain, refrain from the Israelites. They grew impatient. This was taking too long. In other words, they were asking, are we there yet? The dreaded phrase that all of us as parents have heard. Are we there yet? How much longer? I'm hungry. Can we stop to eat? I need to use the bathroom. I'm hungry. And that's what the people of Israel were doing with God. They were going to God and they were saying, look, what's going on here? Have you brought us out here from Egypt? Have you brought us out here to the desert so that we could die? There's no bread, there's no water, and the food you've given us is horrible. Well, God did provide water. God did provide food, namely manna, but they didn't like it. They found it boring. They didn't like that food. even though it was given to them by God. And so they complained. They complained. And they complained some more. And then we see in verse 6, a verse that really takes us back, or takes us aback. The Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. And this stops us cold because it's not how we see God. It's not how we see the God of the New Testament. And we wrestle with this. How could God allow this to happen? How could God do this? This doesn't square with how we see the God of Scripture in the New Testament. 
How do we put these two together? And that's often the struggle for many of us. We see and we often split God. We say, well, this is the God of the Old Testament and this is the God of the New Testament. But that's not what we are to do. Because the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. They are the same. There's no difference. There's no change. And so we wrestle with this notion, this idea that God is punishing his people. That he sent the snakes. And he sent them as a wake-up call. And yet scripture is very clear. They bit the people and many died. This was a tragic event. It wouldn't be the first, it wasn't the first and it wouldn't be the last of these tragic events among the people of Israel because they simply didn't hear God. They didn't listen. They grumbled, they complained, and their faith began to fall. And so here we are once again in another situation where the people of God were struggling. And we struggle with it as well. How can God do this? How can God allow this? How can God cause this? But it's not unusual because there are times where I have heard people say, well, God did this to them. God did this to me. God did this. God did this to punish us. God did this to... And you can fill in the blank. And I don't know if that's the case or not. I don't know if God did this to you. But what I do know and what we need to understand is that God doesn't leave us in our suffering. God doesn't leave us separated from him for very long. God doesn't leave us in our pain and anguish. And if he does, he is right there with us. In the midst of our pain, in the midst of our anguish. The people of God realized very quickly what was happening and they went to Moses and said, we sinned. We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that the snakes will be taken. And Moses did that. And God said to Moses, make a snake, put it up in a pole, and anyone who's bitten and who looks up at it will be saved. They will live. They'll be healed. And so Moses did exactly that. He built this bronze snake, put it up on a pole, and told them, if you look up at the snake, you will live. This would have been quite a shock to the Israelites. You'll remember they got themselves in trouble by building a bronze calf and worshiping it. And yet here is God saying, look up at this bronze snake and you will be saved. You will be healed. The other thing you need to realize is that scripture doesn't tell us that the snakes went away. Scripture doesn't tell us that God removed the snakes and then the statue of the serpent was lifted up. In other words, the snakes were probably still there. The problems of their life were still there, but if they would take time to look up, they would be saved. And so God was giving them that choice to look up or to look down. To look at their feet where the snakes would be to focus on their problems or to look up and trust in the one who gives a solution. To trust in the one who gives hope. And that's often the problem we face because the choice is still the same today. Do we look downward? Do we look inward? at the issues, the problems, and situations that are at our feet? Or are we willing to look up and trust in faith? The Israelites got themselves in, into problems because they were looking downward. They were looking inward. Peter got himself in trouble because he began to look around. He began to look down instead of looking up at Jesus when he was walking on the water. 
Look up. Way up. Anyone want to guess what the TV show is this week? Friendly Giant. The Friendly Giant is a staple for any Canadian child. Uh, generation to generation to generation. The Friendly Giant. From 1958 to 1985, over 3,000 episodes. All of them ad lib. It's interesting to know that all they had was a sheet of paper with an outline on what they wanted to do for that 15 minutes that day. And they ad lib. The whole 15 minutes was ad lib. No written words or anything down, they just went. And it was interesting. This little 15 minute show made such an impact on so many people. Now, part of my childhood was crushed the other day when I learned that the friendly giant stood five foot 11. I'm taller than the Friendly Giant. <laughs> but, as a child, the Friendly Giant seemed larger than life. The Friendly Giant was safety. The castle was protection. It was a safe place to come to, to look up, way up. Now, Friendly Giant did have friends. What were the name of his two friends? Rusty the Rooster, Rusty the Rooster who lived in a book bag that amazingly could hold a lot of stuff in that little bag because every week he would come out with little articles and different things in the book bag. And Jerome the Giraffe, the only giraffe that I have ever seen that had purple spots. And it was always amazing how tall Jerome was. Because he was always coming in the castle window. And I thought, he has got to be the world's largest giraffe. But what was fascinating about the show was the way in which it made us believe that the giant was truly a giant. So I want to begin, I want to share the clip of the opening of the friendly giant. On our way to the castle, and I think for a concert, because Jerome said he was toying with the idea of having a concert. Oh, listen to that. I think that's Fiddle playing field drums so more off in the hills. He's on his way to the castle, so there is a concert. Jerome was more than toying with the idea. He's planned a concert. That's good. There's that big boot. Now look up, way up. And we're on our way to the castle. I'll hurry over first and go in the back door so I can let the drawbridge down and open the big front doors for you. Are you ready? Here's my castle. for one of you and a bigger chair for two more to curl up in. For someone that likes to rock, a rocking chair in the middle. Now, look up. Way up. And I'll call Rusty. Rusty. Hi there. Hi, Rusty. Hi, friendly. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Fine, fine. Where have you been? What have you seen? Or well, heard? Rusty was always dressed like a tablecloth, which always was a little confusing to me as well. <laughs> The other interesting thing about the Friendly Giant was that it actually didn't begin in Canada. 
as much as it has become a part and staple of uh, Canadian culture, it actually began in Wisconsin. And it had its start down there from 1954 to 58. The friendly giant aired in the United States. But it was always the same. Look up. Look way up. There's something reassuring about that. Even hearing it this morning takes me back to a place where I'm a little kid in front of the television watching the friendly giant. Pretending to curl up in the rocking chair. In front of the fire. Listening to the stories being told and shared. Listening to the concerts. Hearing him play the recorder, which is the only use I've ever seen for the recorder, uh, other than grade five music class, where I think you have to learn how to play three blind mice on it. But it is interesting, because here you have the giant, who is typically, or supposed to be, scary, and yet here he is so friendly and opening and welcoming. Now, does anyone remember how he called Rus or called Jerome? Anyone remember? He whistled. Can you whistle the tune? <laughs> oh, that was pretty good. That was uh, pretty good. Uh, and he usually have to do it a couple of times because Jerome just never really appeared too quickly. But all of this reminds us of of looking up and seeing this smiling face. Week after week, episode after episode, it didn't change. You were always looking for the big boot, for that smiling face. And it's very similar to our relationship with God. How much do we miss out on when we do not look up? When we do not look up to God to see what he has in store for us? where he wants us to go, how he wants us to be. This portion of scripture from Numbers is a difficult one because, because we can put ourselves in their place. We've been there. We've experienced it. Where we have done things that has displeased God, where we have done things where we have focused on ourselves and on the problems around us, instead of looking up and allowing God to save us, to heal us, to forgive us, to restore us. But sometimes it's just so hard to look up. It's so hard to look up even when God is calling us. It's so hard to look up because there's so many problems all around us. We look and we see and we become distracted. And it becomes problematic. Because eventually the problems become more and more and more. And we're looking at the problems more and more and more than we are looking at God. Than we're looking at the solution that he has for us. Now this portion of scripture from Numbers would probably have just disappeared. It was just another one of those situations where the Israelites didn't listen to God they were punished, and then they came back to God. It would be the case, except in John, in his gospel, he talks of Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. And we get that famous portion of scripture, for God to love the world that he gave his one and only son. But we get these verses right before it. Just as Moses lifted the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world. In other words, here is Jesus saying, look up. Look way up. Look at the cross. Because in the cross there is salvation. In the cross there is forgiveness. 
In the cross, there is restoration. In the cross, we see God's amazing love. And it's interesting how Jesus compares what is going to happen to him to what happened in that portion of scripture that we read about with the Israelites in the desert. In the same way the snake was lifted up to save, Jesus was going to be lifted up to save, to bring restoration, to bring forgiveness, to bring hope, to restore God's people. But in the same way that the snakes weren't taken away from the Israelites, we realize that in our lives we still face times of trouble, times of difficulty, times of uncertainty. And yet the cross remains. The cross is there for us. It is there to offer us strength and hope, forgiveness and promise. But it requires us to make a choice. A choice to continue to look down or a choice to look up. To look way up and to see God's love to us. Even if we may not understand it fully. Even if it still jars us that God so loved the world that he sent his son to go to a cross for us. We might not understand it. But what we see is God's love. What we see is God's salvation. What we see is God's forgiveness. And that only comes when we look up. Look way up. And see the amazing grace. The amazing gift that God has given to us. May God give us the strength to see. May God give us the strength to lift up our heads. And may we experience God anew. May we experience the safety that comes from looking up and trusting God. May we experience the safety of having our faith placed in Him and Him alone. And may we go forward knowing that He is our rock, our castle, and our protection. And as we make our Lenten journey, we do so knowing that we are a forgiven people and we are called to forgive one another. Let's turn to him now. Let's pray together. Gracious God, you get our attention. You say to us, look up. Look way up. And in looking up, we see the reality that our problems that looked so large now become so small. That the problems that seem to overwhelm seem to disappear as we look at you and your amazing grace, your amazing love, and the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. Give to us the courage to lift our head. Give to us the courage to take those steps in faith. Give to us the courage to trust in you. Even when life seems to go against us, even when we are on the detours of life, even when life seems to be unfair, even when we're tired of the everyday, Help us. Give to us a glimpse of what you have in store for us. Help us to lift our heads, even in our weakness, so that we might experience your mercy, so that we might experience your graciousness, so that we might experience your generousness so that we might realize that you have called us by name through your Son, Jesus Christ. By your grace, we are saved from sin and despair. And you give to us the hope of everlasting life with you. That is the power of the cross. 
That is the power of your love. And that is how great and mighty your love truly is. Our prayer, O oh God, is that each person will know the fullness of your gifts in ways that touch their deepest needs. For we all come with weaknesses. We all come with struggles. We all come with uncertainties. We all come knowing that we need to look up. Meet us in this place, O oh God. Remind us that you are one of us through your Son, that you know the uncertainties we face, you know the struggles that are in front of us, you know that we are afraid that we will do something wrong or choose the wrong direction or make the wrong choice. Give to us your wisdom and guidance through your Holy Spirit. Give to us the courage to take that step in faith. And may we be mindful of your presence with us this day and in the days to come. Gracious God, we are aware of the needs around us this day. For we do not live in isolation. We do not live for ourselves. But we are mindful of the needs of our community of our brothers and sisters. And in the quietness of these moments, we lift their concerns, their burdens to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear us, we pray. Gracious God, we think of the Davis family. And we pray, O oh God, for your hand to be upon them as they mourn Archie's passing. May you comfort them in their loss. And may you be their rock and their protection. We ask, O oh God, for your hand to be upon your people this day. We think of Arthur and Fern and Boyd and Lonnie and Daryl and Perry, and Larry, and June, and Mark. Meet them, each one in their own situation and circumstance. Meet them and surround them with your amazing grace. Touch them with your compassionate love. Speak to them the words that they need to hear. And may we go from here, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, sharing your love that is seen in the cross, a forgiveness that is offered, a forgiveness that is extended, a forgiveness given to each one of us. Sustain us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning, we're going to sing My Faith looks up to thee.
As we go into the world today, may we lift our, up, our eyes up. May we look up and may we see and experience God in a new and powerful way. May we go into the world sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, His love, His grace, and His mercy. May we go from here in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God with us both now and forevermore. Amen.